Hey everyone, it's Jonathan and welcome back to the Disney Movie Marathon. Today we're talking about Disney's The Reluctant Dragon. Like I've done with some of the previous episodes, I'm going to leave the original podcast intro intact, so let's just jump right into it. Hey everyone, welcome to the I Heart Podcast. My name is Jonathan North and welcome to a slightly different sort of episode on our Disney Movie Marathon. Today my cousin Sarah is joining me to talk about the rather obscure Disney film The Reluctant Dragon. For the most part, I've been planning to follow the animated Disney canon timeline, but as you could probably tell from last month's extensive coverage of all things Fantasia, now and then I want to throw in a few extra episodes. The Reluctant Dragon is best known as the title of an animated short that is included on several collections of Disney shorts. If you've heard that title, you are likely familiar with the short. However, this review is covering the full-length feature from which that short was taken. The Reluctant Dragon is the title of a short story that the plot of the movie revolves around. As you can probably tell, this film is not in the official Disney animated canon. However, it was released after Fantasia and before Dumbo, which will be the next film to cover in the series, so I thought this would be a good time to cover it. The Reluctant Dragon is something of an oddball in the Disney film lineup. It's sort of a hybrid film in the sense that it's both animated and live action, not in the cartoons visit the real world or humans visit an animated world sense, but just that it has both animated and live action segments. It's also different in that it's kind of a documentary, even though it's completely scripted. It's just a very different kind of movie all over. I guess I don't have much more to say beyond what we'll be getting into in the review itself, so let's just get on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Disney Movie Marathon. Today we're going to be interrupting the main Disney canon to talk about a live-action animation hybrid, not in the same way that, like Mary Poppins, is a live-action animation hybrid. This one is kind of an odd film, The Reluctant Dragon. This is not one that most people even really know about. I mean, they probably know the short, but the short comes from a full-length movie. Which I feel could be described as a studio tour yeah it's sort of a documentary in a way but very fictionalized and the animation is much better than the live action parts <laughs> which is probably why the reluctant dragon is usually released in compilations of other cartoons instead of in this full-length movie honestly the reluctant dragon is suitable for kids and the live action part has a lot a lot that's geared towards adult 1940s secular sense of humor it's just a weird movie but we'll get into it the guy this is about is somebody named robert benchley who i guess was a radio comedian back in the day i've never heard of him his wife who i don't know if that's his actual no, wife i looked it up she's okay. not I recognized her. She played Mrs. Chumley from Harvey. So if you look at her and you're like, I know that lady, it might be because of that if you are, watch old movies. so She's trying to get him to go to Disney with the book The Reluctant Dragon because she thinks it'll make a great animated movie. And my question is, what gives them the right to sell this book to Walt Disney? <laughs> because they didn't write it. They just own a copy of this book. So why is it that they are, have to be the ones to go to Walt Disney and sell them the rights? Because why do they have the rights? I don't know how much I thought about that. I think I was more fixated on the fact that she is a dominating woman and he acts like a child. Yeah. Like, uh, he's real. shooting little toy ducks at the beginning. He's playing in the swimming pool. Like, maybe she wouldn't treat him like a child if he didn't act like one like they're both a little bit messed up and i think it's supposed to be funny yeah but it's one of those things where it's 1940s humor that doesn't seem to translate that well to 2019 i take, I take issue i think there are still people who think that that type of thing is funny but i think that adults should act like adults and treat each other with kindness and respect <laughs> yeah and they didn't seem to do that at all. So. <laughs> it was a great marriage. <laughs> yeah. It was Thankfully a great it wasn't fake real. Marriage. <laughs> Thankfully it wasn't real. So anyway, they go to Walt Disney Studios and for some reason they're able to easily get in. He's trying to get out of it 
the whole way for some reason. He doesn't want to go. I think maybe it's supposed to be funny, but if somebody was taking you through Disney Studios and giving you a verbal tour while walking you through, why do you treat like that guy like you want to get away from him? Yeah, like, I don't know. Like, is your what is your IQ? And I guess that's just supposed to be funny. And the the tour guide is they act like he's. Like, somebody calls him poison, and I'm like, you're a bully. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> and at this but, point, but, his, it, but, it's, but it's supposed to be funny, you know? I didn't find it funny. At this point, his wife is gone. She went to go shopping, which is probably also supposed to be funny. She abandons him there to go shopping. Yeah. So he's having a horrible time at Walt Disney Studios for some reason, and he keeps... <laughs> escaping from the tour guide and maybe he just wants to go have fun by himself in in walt disney studios like like he's five or something well it could be he kind of gets an accidental tour because he keeps running around all these places dodging the tour guide and which finding they, these people which they did on purpose to show what mm -hmm. the different departments were doing i just feel like they could have written a better story to get this get all these points across yeah. Make a better, more likable character. Um, yeah, I think maybe you were having some similar feelings that I was about the live art class. <laughs> yes, he's like creeping around a life drawing class, acting like a peeping Tom, <laughs> like trying to, sp to spy in, see who's getting drawn. Here's... I'm, I'm, I get to complain now. Here, I love vintage things. One of the best things about this is just getting to see all of the vintage clothes and hairstyles and everything. Mm -hmm. That's probably my, f that might be my favorite thing about the live action thing. It, it, just seeing the look and the times. But the problem with... <sighs> Kind of the 1940s, 50s, probably other decades too, is that they think that it's funny to joke about a married man looking and acting wolfishly towards an unmarried single woman. Mm -hmm. And it's so disrespectful to the commitment of marriage and to their wives and everybody's just supposed to, you know, ha ha, whatever, you know, it's not serious, but it is serious. If you've committed your life to somebody, you should honor that person. And I've seen it not just in this, there's just this whole wolfish thing of that era that's supposed to be funny and acceptable. Mm -hmm. And it's not okay for either party. Like, if you love somebody and you vowed that, you need to honor them. <laughs> and, and with this, it's, it's supposed to... Yeah, he basically wants to go and see a naked woman. And that's supposed to be funny. But he's acting like he's trying to act like that's not what he's trying to do. And he kind of gets caught in it. It turns out to be an elephant, thankfully. Um, but then that led to another weird scene where he's making fun of the elephant for some reason. Which I also didn't appreciate because I view elephants as one of the most endearing, intelligent creatures on the face of the planet. <laughs> so, and he's talking about how stupid they are. And which was also supposed to be funny because somebody drew him as an elephant. And it was just also the humor of the times that, like, old humor can be hilarious or it can be, I don't know, tacky, outdated, and just plain wrong. <laughs> It just it's, it's it, definitely tacky and out there, and, and in some cases just plain wrong. Yeah, and you could tell oh, the elephant was not always the model for that class, like one or more pieces of artwork. So they they definitely got the point a lot. Like if you're an adult, you get what's mm -hmm. what's going on. Maybe if you're five, maybe if you're lucky, you'll miss it. But yeah, one of the instances where you can tell they were gearing the humor towards adults and not towards children. 
It was just a weird, cringy scene. <laughs> the next part was far more endearing. Yes. Where he ends up in with an, you know, watching an orchestra, but it's a woman singing in the chicken voice yes. along with the man who plays Donald Duck. It'd and be Florence Gill, who played, I can't remember her name, but the opera singing chicken in one or more old Disney cartoons, and then Clarence Nash, who and was the voice of Donald Duck for she, decades. She had serious chicken skills. And yes. So that, that was a lot more fun of a scene. Yes, I enjoyed seeing them doing their thing. And then, keeping with the voiceover thing, he goes and meets Doris, who wasn't actually Doris, because I looked her up. She was a, just an actress playing the part of supposedly the voice of Casey Jr. I guess she was in this short, but she wasn't in the movie Dumbo. I'm but, not sure what all of the reasons for that were. I hope that they weren't being mean to the person who actually played, like excluding her somehow. I hope that that was not, had nothing to do with it. I have no idea. I don't really even know who played the voice of Casey Jr. because she only had like one or two credits on IMDb. This is also crazy because when you hear Casey Jr., you think that it's totally a man doing the voice, not... not the device that they use, you have this gorgeous woman mm -hmm. doing this raspy train voice, but it's just the technology that they used. And the the short that they had to go along with all of the sound effects that they were making was not from Dumbo, mm -mm. but it did have a train. It was, it was the character of the train from Dumbo, just a completely different story, just yeah. kind of random scenes there, showing the train doing things. As you go to the different departments, you have plenty of animation mm -hmm. thrown in there with the different scenes. And the animation was, like, by far the best part of, of everything in this. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things that he does see, but it's all mostly tied in with his cringy humor that I wasn't a fan of. Mm. Then you have a demonstration of the multiplane camera. And up until this point, the movie has been in black and white. But when he goes into this room, everything becomes technicolor. And this was one bit of humor that I did actually enjoy. He kind of breaks the fourth wall. And he's like, oh, I'm color now. <laughs> he doesn't say that, but it's like you get that point. He did make some kind of comment, though, about how different something looked in color mm -hmm. it was like the entire world suddenly became color because he went into that room which that that humor that was i okay. did appreciate it, was okay. it wasn't cringy 40s humor it was clever which honestly okay if you watch i don't know a 1940s film noir or something or, or even just just a plain live action film from the 40s cary grant Probably about any film. I have, I have not watched all of his films, so I'm not, like, saying every Cary Grant film. You can have such fast-paced, witty dialogue that is genuinely funny. So I'm not mm -hmm. trying to say that all humor... No, no. You know that I'm not saying that. There's just... There are certain strains from that era. Yes. And I would say the same for today. It just comes in different forms at different mm -hmm. times. So. Yeah. So he's in the room with the multiplane camera, and then Doris comes back. I'm not sure. I think she was just supposed to be a generic animator, somebody who worked at the studio. I guess not animator, because I think the women mainly worked in ink and paint. But she was some sort of person. She played many roles in this one role. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's an actual person who did everything that she does. And her hair was delightfully fluffy, and her dress was a beautiful shade of pink. Yeah, I think they wanted her there for eye candy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you get that impression because she's holding up a picture of Bambi that's clear all around Bambi, and then she's talking about how she's going to go put it where against the background where it belongs, and he likes the background that it already oh, has. Oh, yeah, because she was behind it. Uh-huh. You're married, Benchley. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, there were some cute little scenes in here where she's like showing off the animation. Donald Duck comes to life, Bambi comes to life. And it was interesting to see the camera being used. Yeah, I did enjoy when they when he went up high and looked through. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite parts, I would say, was when they went to 
the department where all the colors. Yes, that was really interesting. Were being made. They had all the ladies in it's, their scientific it, yeah, outfits. Yeah, it's a total mixing. lab. Yeah, and, it was really cool. And just showing all of the different shades seems like something that my family would enjoy. Yeah, this watching. is this is another instance where like if it weren't for all the cringy humor that was laced throughout, this would be like really good. I would re- this is really interesting. I liked this kind of thing. It gives you insight into what was happening because I didn't realize that there was such in-depth color mixing, color mm-hmm. making, and then with the cart going by and somebody picking off the exact shade that they needed for what mm-hmm. they were working on. Yeah. It was educational. <laughs> yes. And then you move on from ink and paint to the maquette. And here we get more cringy humor because Benchley is way too interested in a topless centaurette. I'm assuming from Fantasia, even though I didn't recognize the character. She but like, would have been the one that was taken out. She would have been the servant, remember? Oh, maybe. Because she was black with a zebra body. Well, they did have some zebra body characters in there, but this really? one looked different. Well, I bet she was the one that was taken out. She Well, I know the one that was taken out was like a really racist character. Oh, okay. This one wasn't quite that. Yeah, I but think, I still didn't I think recognize maybe, her. I think maybe I remember the face being different now that you mention it either which, way which i didn't pay as much attention to the centaurettes when we watched it because i'm not excited about topless women i don't care if they have horse bodies and if they're missing some detail i don't like it either way i feel like there was more focus on that in this movie than there was in Fantasia. Because in Fantasia, they're off when they don't have a top. They're off in the distance and like waterfalls around them. And then when they come out, the babies drape flowers over them. So they're like covered up. But this, it was like... She's not covered up and she's in a suggestive position. And he's and, like, ooh, and, leering and over he this ta- toy. And he takes off with it too. Yeah. That was not... Super creepy. He was just... It's like, are you wanting to show this off to the men in the audience or something? Like, It was just weird. and Why couldn't he have taken off with ca- the Captain Hook figurine or something? <laughs> he didn't want that one. I know. <laughs> anyway. They I'm, moved- glad that, I'm glad I'm not the only one that was like, oh, come on. <laughs> there was more stuff in this scene that was interesting because like, you show it shows them making the sculptures and everything and like if they had just focused in on like nice little figurines of the characters and the sculpting instead of him being all creepy over the one that didn't have a top <laughs> okay. yeah uh, and he certainly didn't need to take off with it yeah mm. it's just yeah it was weird <laughs> I, I liked seeing them make the sculptures, but it's just another instance of his creepy humor kind of putting a damper on the scene. He does get to keep, like, a sculpture of his head. He wanders off with that. Like, he's collecting all of these different things as he's going along, I think. But he couldn't be satisfied with that. <laughs> Anyways, he moves on from there to the storyboard department. And then you have another, it's sort of an animated short, but it's told with storyboards about baby weems. Some of it was moving, or was it all pictures? There was some slight animation. Not like fluid animation, but... But with the way they told it, it practically felt like fluid animation. Yeah, like once you got into the story, it didn't matter that it was just storyboards. And they were not storyboards as in rough sketches. They like, they fully fleshed out the drawings with color and everything. And music and and everything. It was, it was an animated short with very little animation. And the story was amusing. Yeah. I, I liked the short. There was a little bit of humor in there that would not fly today. I was, the part where they were talking about people all over the world and there was some really racist like people talk about dumbo i remember there was one um figure in particular that was extremely exaggerated i was like if if the people who complain about dumbo saw this they would forget about dumbo yeah dumbo is absolutely nothing (laughs) (laughs) and i'm not saying that dumbo is the best but this one yeah was this one was something else that aside, the baby weems was yes. ridiculous, unbelievable, cute, yeah, and sweet, and 
funny. I liked it too. I liked this. Yeah, it was actually amusing. Yeah. And they could, if they ever wanted to show that story, they could easily cut out that part. Yeah. But anyway. Once he gets through the storyboard department, he moves on to the animation department. And here we get another cartoon. This is Goofy, How to Ride a Horse. And I think I read that this was the first Goofy short where it's how to fill in the blank, do something. Did Were there a lot of those? Yeah, there was like a whole series of Goofy learning learning how to do things which it kind of went on and on yeah and not all of it was funny but actually part of it was funny yeah it was an amusing enough cartoon it was funnier than a lot of the stuff with benchley anyway that's true that's true i would rather have a lot of redundant humor than benchley's my humor my favorite part was when the horse was given carrots and then he was thoroughly <laughs> harassing for treats because as a pet owner it was it was very relatable <laughs> like i know you have more uh, at least i'm pretty sure i, I hope <laughs> after he watches the cartoon he's finally caught by the tour guide who delivers him to disney and who was practically on the verge of being fired or something because yeah. he, he was supposed to keep track of this guy, and he was trying so hard. Yeah. If you can't tell, we're not a fan of eventually and all of his actions. <laughs> I wonder if he was any funnier on the radio. Who knows? I don't want to find out. <laughs> I have no interest in going and looking up Benchley's body of work. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I, I just wonder if it's any better. I'm going to guess not, but I could be wrong. Yeah. So he's delivered to Walt Disney, and so this is where Disney discovers that he's stolen his centaurette well, maquette. Well, like, nobody really cared, but the thing was is that he was trying to find the story that he was supposed to show to Walt, so he's handing him mm. all of these things, like the, the sculpted head and I think maybe some papers, and he hauls that out of wherever... I think it was like a line like, ooh, how do you like it in there? Or something funny. <laughs> and he doesn't quite get to it. And Walt is going to have him watch this thing that they've just made. And it turns out to be the reluctant dragon that he was supposed to go and pitch to him. Mm -hmm. So the reluctant dragon is like the main thing from this film that everybody remembers. I'm not sure if I'd ever seen it, though, but you seem to remember having I watched it. I feel like I grew up watching this. I know that I watched this. I don't know how many times, but I have quoted it probably even as an adult. It was memorable enough that, you know, like, the reddish so red, reddish so red. <laughs> and, yeah. Basically, the story is about a little boy who seems to like reading dragon stories. Mm -hmm. And his father informs him that there's a dragon. And his father is terrified, but he's not. The little boy goes off to check out the dragon and discovers that this dragon is a total cream puff who likes to write poetry and doesn't want anything to do with fighting it, doesn't agree with him. So they get in a knight to come and fight the dragon, and the knight turns out to be a bit of a cream puff who likes to write poetry mm -hmm. as well, who's quite happy to fight a dragon, but the little boy is trying to help the dragon out, brings the knight to visit the dragon, and the knight and the dragon become friends and recite poetry to each other. But everybody's expecting a fight. Everybody thinks that the dragon is scary, so they put on a fake fight. Which was pretty funny yes this is a cute funny cartoon it's not gut wrenching in any way <laughs> shape or form unless it's the bathtub scene with the night where it's like that bucket needs to not be any smaller <laughs> i forgot about that part. <laughs> <laughs> this is the borderline anyway um <laughs> and there's no full-on nudity in this cartoon you know and then afterwards, it's like the dragon gets tamed by the knight after this mm -hmm. fake fight. And he's basically adopted as a friend of the citizenry and they're having a feast and everyone's happy. The yeah. end. It was cute and funny. That cartoon, I can see why people would keep it and watch it even today and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It's not outdated. 
No. It's sweet. It it definitely is much better than the film that surrounds it. I think that you could probably watch other tours of the studio, other documentaries about the studio, and just leave it at that. I feel and like then, and keep the cartoon separate. I think Walt Disney had a TV show where he did something similar to what this movie does, except I'm sure it was a lot better and a lot more family friendly than this. Because sure. I've seen little bits of his show, and a lot of it was like explaining how different movies were made. So I'm sure that which the if, content in this you can probably find elsewhere too. Yeah, which if he's narrating it, then it's going to be far more professional. Mm-hmm. So I would say if you want to watch The Reluctant Dragon, fine. But the rest of it is kind of forgettable. Even the other animation is like it's good. It's but not. It's not necessarily worth it to slog through all of the other stuff that Mm -hmm. surrounds it so you might as well watch the reluctant dragon and watch documentaries of disney if you're interested in that separately Mm -hmm. and just watch the other cartoons separately yeah unless you have some specific reason which you probably don't then i'd recommend the reluctant dragon itself so then after the cartoon ends he leaves And for some reason, his wife is berating him for being too slow. But, like, these movies take a long time to make. So this is, even if you're going within the world of this movie, the movie was in production for far longer than they were talking about delivering the book to Walt Disney. So she shouldn't have any beef with him, but then that wouldn't be within her nagging wife character. That they gave to her. So she's nagging him. And he's just, like, sitting across from her all grumpy. And then he, like, yells at her in Donald Duck's voice for some reason. Like, oh, fooey. Something like that, which is supposed to be hilarious. And then that's the end of the movie. I had already forgotten about the end of it. You're bringing it back. (laughs) So. Yeah, it was. Forgettable. If you're lucky. (laughs) The, The boring parts were forgettable and... The, the the parts you want to be forgettable aren't forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, this is probably now like at the bottom of my Disney movie ranking list. I'm glad that we're reviewing this because now we can work on not thinking about it. <laughs> like before, it's like, okay, we still need to review it. Oh, that's in turret. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this skip. Almost all of the movie. Just find the Rock and Dragon as a cartoon by itself. Yep. That's that's all you really need Get to your watch. Get warm fuzzies. The yeah. end. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's going to be all for this episode. Um, I think we recorded them out of order, but I think Dumbo is going to be next. So that'll be in a week or two, probably. I don't know how long I'm going to stretch these out, but Dumbo will be next. And after that, we'll get to Bambi. <laughs> oh boy. We've been talking about that one. I gave her my book to read. I'll probably like to... the the movie more than... I haven't been... Like, I haven't read the book. I have heard synopsis of the book. I The I weird thing is, I haven't read that book in years. I read it when I was a kid. I loved it when I was a kid. But really? it's not a kid's book. <laughs> and, like, I remember reading it and being horrified. <laughs> But you loved it. Yes. I mean, I wasn't horrified by the whole thing, but there were scenes in it that was like, (laughs) like things that I'd... And you want me to read this? It's probably going to be very... It's not going to be that as bad for you because you already know what I'm talking about because I've told you about them before. Well, the fact that I've watched somebody talking about the synopsis and everything... And the fact that I grew up watching nature programs and I grew up surrounded by nature, it's going to be, if I read it, if I actually put myself through that, there will be sadness. But, yeah, I'm more prepared for it than I would have been probably. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll, we'll get to that eventually. Probably Death and m- orphans. <laughs> more orphans, yes. We are just having a discussion about... Liking stories with orphans. <laughs> Anyways, we're rabbit trailing. We'll get to the orphan baby deer after a while. I guess he wasn't an orphan. He still had his dad. Oh, 
I don't Still. know. I don't know how much a buck counts. <laughs> Either way, we're rambling now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. There will be it. more there will be more Disney movie marathon soon. All right. <laughs> we'll see you then. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Disney Movie Marathon. If you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe on your preferred podcast platform or to our YouTube channel. Make sure to follow my co-hosts as well. Any relevant links will be in the description for easy access. We'll be back soon with another brand new episode, so thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.